All right, so I, I'm always really excited when um, we have the color collab because I inevitably learn way more than I thought I knew. And I think Sally Lynn has got a demo scheduled for us today um, using the jelly plate and what she calls an aha moment. So that's gonna be fun to be a part of. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, well, hello. I'm sorry if there's a little bit of feedback because I have two cameras going, which is why you see you know, me here and me boobs over there, sorry. <laughs> um, but we're talking about um, chromatic harmonies, uh, chromatic scales. And it was like one of my most favorite things about complementary colors. So a quick recap, complementary colors, there's two kinds, the complementary colors that everyone says are across the color wheel from each other meaning like the generics of yellow and purple or orange and blue. And then there's mixing complements. And these are colors that literally neutralize each other out. Um, so you can use them to create shadows and depth and form. Um, so we're talking about mixing complements today and color harmony. So the two colors that I'm working with today are pyrrole orange and cobalt turquoise. Okay, and these are these are two colors that are wonderful to work with, and you don't necessarily think about them when you think about painting oranges or, or ocean waves, but it's, it's a lot of fun to work with. So I'm gonna go through some different things. Um, the first thing that you do when you're creating a chromatic scale is you mix some of the orange with some of the turquoise to create a neutral mixture. It's very important. A neutral mixture of the orange and the blue that is neither orange or blue, it's just that middle ground. And you know you don't have a mixing complement when that creates like a green, <laughs> because it should be a brown or a gray or a black. Um, and those are then a nice um, mixing complements. There is very little harmony among these colors. I'm gonna show you what they look like first, just on the screen. Just a moment, everyone see that okay? Okay, good. So chromatic scales. So the pyrrole orange, the cobalt turquoise. When I start mixing them together to try and create that, you know, mixing neutral mixing color, the neutral mix, I discovered that, well, it takes a lot more turquoise to neutralize that orange than vice versa. So that was that's the first lesson when you're mixing. Um, people often say, oh, just use equal amounts of each, which is not true. You don't use equal amounts of each in most cases because one color will have a higher tinting strength than the other. Let me give you another example. Um, I call this one the Miami Dolphins. <sighs> so basically, these are the three colors laid out side by side. And you know, yes, they're gonna create that complementary color tension you know, that we expect from complementary colors. I literally think of it as the Miami Dolphins and a referee in the middle, you know, neutralizing both of them. So that's how mixing complements work. But in a painting, if you're going for something super high graphic, that'll be a good thing. But the way we wanna use these is really to create a scale of different colors in between these two. So that's where a chromatic scale is a useful tool. It creates a progression of mixtures, you know, stepping from the initial color, you know, from the mixed neutral to the initial color. And when you create these progressions, all of the resulting mixtures have, actually have like the same value, basically. And then you can, you know, use the neutral grays to change that value up and down if you want to. But they share a common ingredient. I know Donna has often said mother color. I've seen that term used in many places. They all, all of the colors in your scales will have a mother color, so they all go together. Okay, so tinting strength is at play. So I'm going to stop that share for a moment and show you how to find out about tinting strength. So when you go to Golden's website and you scroll down to any color, you know, like we can go to products, heavy body, pyrrole orange, and bring up the technical details. That's where at the bottom they list the tinting strength. Now here's something, this is kind of like wire gauge, how bigger numbers are smaller than larger numbers. <laughs> you know, um, the same thing is true with tinting strength. A higher number means it's weaker than something that has a lower number. 
So the tinting strength of pyrrole orange is 81 and change. And the tinting strength for cobalt turquoise, I believe is like 86 and change. So let me um, go over those numbers again. So the orange had a tinting strength of 81.55 and the turquoise has a tinting strength of 86.04. And you wouldn't think that means much, but when I'm trying to actually mix these to create a neutral, those few decimal point differences mean the world. So let me show you the um, mixing. It actually takes one part orange to two parts turquoise to create that neutral mix. So literally orange is double the strength of cobalt turquoise, even though it's those five decimal points difference. So that makes a big deal, a big difference in how you mix colors. So hello, here I am. Yay. <laughs> okay, so these two colors, um, cobalt turquoise and pyrrole orange. If I wanted to create the mixing neutral, there's two things I do. First of all, I'm gonna go jump on the golden mixer tool usually and start playing around with it and seeing what that ingredient, you know, what that recipe is. And I discovered already that it's like, one part orange to two parts cobalt turquoise. So the orange is much stronger in this mix. So, sorry, I have not cleaned up from my last play session. <laughs> this is just a glass palette. And it's a wonderful because it's a neutral gray color in the background. Um, I'm gonna make sure that I'm pinned so you guys can see me. Spotlighted or whatever, there. That's probably better. So everyone can see me at the figure in the middle. <laughs> okay, so um, when I take these colors and put them on the palette, I barely have any space here that isn't already filled with stuff. Sorry, <laughs> I'm gonna put a couple, a little bit of these colors here. Okay, now it's about trying to find a middle ground. What I like about this kind of palette, if you haven't seen one before, it's a neutral gray. So you actually, instead of using a white, which might show you a little bit of a tinted color, it's a neutral gray. So it's not gonna interfere with what the colors look like visually. It's, a, it's an interesting concept and I, I've always loved this kind of thing. Um, so tinting strength is important. What we wanna do is take these two colors, and because I know orange is so strong, I'm gonna take just a little bit of the purple on my palette. And I'm gonna use a separate brush for the orange just to make it easier on myself. And just like the tiniest smidgen of a smidge of the orange and mix it in there. And you can start to see it's definitely getting darker. Now I'm gonna smidge it again. Just a little bit, because I just want to, you know, get to this point. And when you're doing this, it's okay to create a big honk and pile of this middle color. It really is, because you're going to use it a lot. It's already getting a lot more gray. It's looking a lot more like the palette itself, which is also helpful when doing this kind of mixing, because you've got gray against gray. Makes life easy. Yeah, we're getting there really fast now, and we just use tiny smidgety smidges. So I'm going to put that on a piece of paper real quick and see what it looks like. So very gray. So that is how quickly we got from turquoise to the mixing neutral. Now, this is the thing that I want to point out to you that is so important to know about how this works. When you are trying to create these chromatic scales, which is, background stuff here. When you're trying to create these, trying to get from here to here can be very difficult if you keep adding orange to the turquoise. The point of creating that mixing neutral in the middle is it is, even though it looks gray to you and I, what it really is, it is orange and turquoise. <laughs> and so I'm taking the orange and turquoise middle ground and I can add it to the orange and start mixing to create. Instead of adding the turquoise to the orange, I'm adding the middle and a little bit more of the little, a little bit more of the middle. I keep adding it until eventually my orange looks like this. So instead of trying to constantly add turquoise to the orange, 
we can just keep adding the neutral to the orange to get the scale of orange to neutral. That's what we're trying to do. If you sat here and tried to add the orange to the turquoise to get a scale, you would make yourself crazy. So you can never overstep if you start mixing the turquoise you know, with the neutral, you'll never get you know, too orange or too gray too fast. So it can never go beyond the neutral if you use the neutral to create your scale with. How so does that I mean, compare really to the neutral colors? Well, the neutral colors aren't made up of these colors. And so the best way I can describe it is that in here, these are all, it has a mother color. And it also, when they start, pigments start separating and stuff, when you're actually painting and water gets involved, it's such a good question. I love you. <laughs> this is why you'll like it. I don't know how well you can see that. Do you see the separation of the pigments? that's mm -hmm. happening yeah that's what you get when you actually mix with the other color so the colors are like they're together and they're they're working together instead of just throwing basically black and white at them <laughs> which is what the neutral grays are doing the neutral grays are about creating value up and down without adding any chroma to the mix and with this i'm actually getting a shadow if we think about shadows literally about our atmosphere is blue and shadows are blue so in this case you know it's nice to be adding that blue into my orange to create shadow rather than adding black so mm. our gray don't think of it as gray think of it as neutralized orange and blue <laughs> and Good that's point. why it's so powerful because you're going to have these gorgeous colors that are all going to work together and all you know, are made of each other instead of throwing black or white in the mix. That's why I often call black and white referee colors, you know, because they neutralize everybody and they just, you know, cut, you know, shut down the play. <laughs> so you definitely want to use each other when you're doing a mixing to create shadow and form with complementary colors. And that's why, Lee, and look at how we've got now a wonderful mix of colors, so many to work with, when before we just had you know, the Miami Dolphins and the referee. And that's I think all it's so powerful over. what you just said, that it's not gray. It is literally still cobalt, turquoise, and orange. And they are playing off of each other. And probably just that tension creates more interest in your work. Because Absolutely. even the colors are creating their own tension in fighting for one to emerge versus the other. So I love because that thought. I love you. When we do scales, Donna, we're creating pairs of complementary colors, <laughs> mixing complements basically in, in its own way. So we're creating more of it. So it's interesting because they become dull and you know more dull and they're great for things that are more off in the distance or if you just want things that have a different sort of chroma to them but they're still complements to each other so you're going to get that nice you know tension going on but it's not going to be as jarring it's going to be more like everything goes together and i have some samples to show you um i apologize the studio is kind of like the only space in here i don't have room for a lot of canvases so everything is packed up because i have my first floor is literally on the second floor with me. <laughs> but um, this is just something I wanted to share with you. First and foremost, when you're trying to figure out chromatic scales so that you can get these things so that you can have, you know, the orange and all the shadow at the bottom of the plate, you know, or the ocean and all the shadows, you know, reaching up to the beautiful sunset. <laughs> That's basically what I think about when I think about these two colors, because I'm more representational. Sorry, abstract people, <laughs> but it works that way. And the only way to get there is if you mix using your mixing neutral to create the scale. Because the minute you start trying to put more orange into your turquoise, you're going to get really frustrated really fast because it's going to go faster than you think it's going to go, depending on how strong the tinting strength is of one of those colors. So do we understand that? Because that's super important. To, and to, and to I'm get. assuming that there are limited mixing neutrals in the golden color scheme that will authentically do what you're talking about right it's an interesting that's an interesting story because i pick cobalt turquoise i'm gonna flip to my, no i'm gonna stay here 
Hello. <laughs> I mix cobalt turquoise with with the orange. That's my choice. But if I was choosing a mixing complement for the turquoise, I might actually go for violet oxide. So it's just that comes with playing in time and you just play around with it. So it's kind of like I'm choosing who is the dominant color in my composition. And for the one that I had in mind, literally had oranges in it. So I'm like, that's the dominant color. So this is what I'm going to be painting later in the week, which is my I've got my sketch all put together for my oranges. And the bowl is going to be the turquoise. And so I've got to have I wanted the oranges to be the thing that I worked with the most and that I wanted the most shadow for and this and that. So it's something that you learn over time is who is a good mixing complement because it's not necessarily a reciprocal relationship. Sometimes other colors just work well with others too. You know, everybody- Is there a rule? Is there a, a general rule that would make the learning of that easier? Yes, generally whatever i mean the most general portion of it i think we all get stuffed down our throats every time we pick up a book where it's like you know red and green yellow and purple so you start there and in this case an, a violet oxide has actually got a lot of red in it it's actually a you know it's a it's an an, an oxide that's just been pumped up with some other colors and so i started looking at everything that was red to mess you know reddish orange to mess with my blue and that's how i came across it so the general information that we have about what is opposite on that, you know, 12 color color wheel is where you start. And so we know all of that already. And that's where you can just start literally dabbling with the mixer and seeing, you know, coming up with those solutions without having to delve into the paint. You can delve into the paint too, but it's nice to start there to like do your homework. And then you grab those tubes and start and start mixing with it in person and creating the scales. So I find the digital mixer is something I use all the time to discover this stuff. Because would I ever have done that on my own? Probably not. But I literally pulled up everything that was orange just and just started. And I felt and like, okay, maybe I can get something better. Transparency, does that affect the ease in which we find that middle ground? It it affects often for me, the strength, like these two colors are both single pigment colors, which first off, that's, that's so important because when you do that, then you know for sure that you're not having some hidden blue or other color that's under, underneath or part of the makeup of that paint fighting with you. So knowing what the pigment codes are is important too. So I chose two that were single pigment colors and they're both semi-opaque. If one was more transparent, it's gonna fight harder to cover up the opaque one, generally. So these two on all playing fields are the same except for tinting strength. So yeah, every single component of their makeup makes a difference in how they work together. And But it's fun to know what all those things are and what they mean, <laughs> so you can figure it out. And that's what we're here yeah. for. You know, even in, I know we're talking about neutralizing, but even in the concept of taking two colors that you'd like to work with that are far, far removed from being friends, um, and just even if they're not going to make a neutral, mixing them and then taking the mixture and adding it back into those colors in your work is a really powerful tool, I think. Because what if you do want to use cadmium red and green gold in the same painting? How do you get them to be friends in the painting? It's by mixing them together, coming up with a mother color, and then taking the mother color and mixing it back in. I think that's a powerful weapon. Yep, it's all part of the, having that you know limited palette of colors, picking those colors and making them work for you. And this is a way of doing it by getting finding whatever that middle ground is where one color, it doesn't read green gold and it doesn't read cadmium red, it reads other. And then you know you're at your middle neutral. And that's why you spend time creating these big puddles on your palette because once you find that, you're gonna use it a lot in your painting. And, you know, much more than, you know, all the little dapples to find the in-between steps. Those are informative, you know, and that's where you'll like, okay, now I just know I just dip the brush in. Okay, maybe a little bit more of it, but you're going to be so much faster in your practice when you get to that middle ground and then use it to mix backward. Okay. All right. Now here is when I was first learning how to do this, 
the best lesson I ever did was on by mistake. <laughs> so I'm going to show you it because I, oh my goodness, I have my gel plate sitting underneath my palette. Palette to the side, so I'm not going to get paint on everything. Hello, I'm back. Okay, little gel plate. You can see that good. All right, now this is, I think, a great exercise for getting an understanding of what how they work together and what's in between super fast and it's it really for me sometimes it may help me make a decision on a painting i change my mind just based on a two minute play session on a plate so i'm going to put the orange up in one corner and the turquoise in the other and you could be top and bottom i, I just seem to like to do it corner to corner it gives me more space i think and then I'm going to use two brayers just for the ease of, of doing this process. So I'm gonna lay out, I like to lay out maybe the turquoise first and just get that laid out on the plate. And you know, I'm gonna even roll this up. I might need to put a little bit more on here. I was being skimpy. Okay, we're gonna roll out, see me okay, yeah. Roll this out onto the plate and like two thirds of the way up, you know, we, we want the other color. We want each color to have its own space, but really only in the corner, in the very corner. We just want to have the rest of it play with its friend. So covering that up with the first color. And I can just leave that brayer loaded up. This is golden open I'm using, by the way. Um, or you could use open medium because with mono printing, especially in the amount of time I'm gonna manipulate this, you're gonna want some open time. Um, so you can put medium in it. So now I have the other color, just getting my brayer sort of loaded up and then rolling it across. And this is where you just kind of want some control. You don't wanna to go too much back and forth because my brayer is definitely loaded with both colors. So I'm gonna go off to the side and clean that off a little bit. So I'm not spreading too much. And then I'll kind of go back and bring it in, clean it off. And, you know, just kind of keep going over towards the turquoise. And I have done this before where I discover that, hey, I need a little bit more of the orange. That's fine. Just start at the beginning and roll your way over. So yeah, I feel like this is a pretty good representation of it. We have ish pure orange on one end and turquoise on the other end and you know so this is a nice representation as you can visually see right now there's kind of a i know it's hard to see because it's shiny but there's kind of a gray sort of in the middle of the two so i know that i'm, I'm in a good place here's another funky trick i like to do um i'll take a stencil just grab something off the rack here it's so hard to choose Okay, take a stencil and lay it down on top. <laughs> There's actually a method to this madness because when you're working with them, if I'm gonna pull a print, that print is made out of a piece of white paper and white paper is in essence, it's tinting. So if I remove some paint so that I'll expose the white beneath, I'm gonna be able to see tinted versions of these colors wherever the stencil touched it. All right. So I'm just placing the stencil on top, literally kissing it with the stencil, making sure it's made contact. I could brayer over it, but I really don't wanna mix them anymore. Let's just make some contact and then lift that off. Just wanna kiss it. Okay, now I've got a design on there. So when I place my piece of paper on top and pull a print, Doing things live. <laughs> doing awesome. You're going to get a chromatic scale between the two colors. Love that. So you'll, you'll be able to see all the different things. And it's like this super fast. And wherever the stencil was touching, you kind of get a tinted version of every color because it lifts it off and you expose the paper <laughs> underneath more. One more fun thing to do with this. I don't need to pull another print to clean it up. I'm gonna put the two colors back on and I'm gonna show you using a gel plate as a palette. 
if you're doing a small work or if you have a larger gel plate and once again you're using golden open so that the paints stay wet i'm just gonna get this going across here so that's like i always know when i'm just doing gel printing i only know how to put too much paint everywhere i have no problem applying tons All right orange it up, cover back, going it across. And you know what I end up with is the chromatic scale again on the gel plate. Right and go this way. Yeah. Okay. So now I have a palette of all these colors. And so Literally, if I was doing a very small piece and I just wanted to go, okay, grab the orange, you know, then, okay, go to the next one, grab the next one over, cleaning the brush, go get the next one. I'm gonna see the scale live, you know, as it comes, you know, so I can kind of see all the colors that I have to use without even doing the mixing with the mixing neutral. It's a fast and dirty, way to get that same scale. Mind blown. Super fast, super dirty, so little paint used. Because if you're trying to make a decision, I don't know about you, but I hate using paint. So there was my chromatic scale with the oranges. Just by having that gray just, that just blew my mind. Oh I hope so. I like I like learning moments, aha moments because that's what it was to me. Now the same thing happens over here. I could start with a pure color from the tube. Honestly, at the top would probably be a more accurate because there's probably one step more of pure color, you know, that I could get a pure mass tone. But just doing this work, cleaning the brush, wiping it off, and moving your way across, you're gonna see how quickly that starts turning gray. It just, it's amazing how quickly you get to gray so you know that there's gonna be a lot of work involved to really figure out you know several steps in between i'm literally doing little half steps here to see if i can get something sort of in between the two colors but um it's an amazing exercise very quick without having to sit there it gives you your goals and then you can sit there and mix it and try to make those goals so when you're actually going to make a painting then you can have a little dab of each of those already mixed and ready to go you know what the what you're aiming towards okay that right there is good for anything that little trick even though i know you're doing the chromatic scale that's amazing for mixing any two colors and finding the bias of colors i know <laughs> mm -hmm. i use it as a tool all the time because it's it's more than just it's just another tool it like a paintbrush or a palette knife for mixing in my studio. And so much less paint. Yeah, it just was a little dab there, a little dab there. And then I really, if I'm doing a small work, Donna, you know, I could pull from the real color where I want it, but I have all this in between and it's gonna stay fresh on here. It's open paint. So I have all of this to mm. work with for a small work. Brilliant. Yeah, well, thank you. Especially when you get to the end of painting and you just want to add a little more value, a little more difference in a couple places, this is your cheat sheet. <laughs> get it on here. And, and if you were going to mix that, there it would be hours and hours of mixing to try to get the in-between steps of those colors, like just to get it right. And now you're like, you can see it in relationship to the starting color. Now I know it's not exactly a scale but you certainly know whether the color is you know towards the orange more or towards the turquoise more instead of just mixing it where they all look like the same color yeah it's very difficult to mix otherwise and for me the, you know a long time ago i said you know this is this is the best way i can even see if i like two colors together and i would just start by pulling one of these and then i'd be and like then okay, you just make jelly prints idea. if you don't yeah, and, and it's funny because most people would look at this and go, oh, it's mud. I'm like, 
it's supposed to be mud. <laughs> That's the goal. Um, oftentimes when things make mud on my gel plate, when I'm just doing, you know, mono printing, I'll be like, oh, write that down. I'm going to go for that one later when I'm doing something else. All right. So anyway, I hope that is helpful. Of course, this is all recorded and we got all, and um, I don't ever leave you without a handout. So let me show you what I've got for you. Let me just clean up and switch. The I feedback in the chat time. is just uh, kind of mind blown. And another way people are saying, oh, another way to finally use my jelly plate, which is true. How many of us have jelly plates in all sizes that are just collecting dust? Um, I, I just think that instead of using the jelly plate, I, I love the idea that the jelly plate becomes a tool to help me understand paint instead of having to figure out what to do with the jelly plate in and of itself. Okay. Um, uh, what I'm going to do next, I'm going to try to share the screen because I want to show you the handout that I made um, that I think helps kind of bring some of this together and then we're going to show some um, some examples. All right. And then we can open the floor. Share. Okay, so we talked a little bit about chromatic scales about figuring out and we can use the digital mixer in order to you know, figure out what some good mixing complements are and what ratio works. And that'll kind of tell us who's stronger than the other one. Okay. Um, and then I showed you the Miami Dolphins and the referee. <laughs> and we you know why we kind of want to have some steps in between them, why there's not a lot of harmony there. So then the next thing we showed was doing mixing on the gel plate. And so taking those two colors and even using a stencil and lifting it off to get an idea of the tints that are possible with all of the scale in between. So the end result of that is this guy. So mm. this is showing you, this is your handout that is gonna be up on Donna's Patreon um, as a PDF. So it's showing you two colors, how one is stronger than the other and how that ratio works again. And then I wanted to show you the, this picture because I want to paint this. And it's, you know, it's wonderful, these winter berries inside of a beautiful blue glass jar. Can everyone see that okay? Good. Um, let's see if I can make it bigger. Nope, I guess that's as big as we're gonna get it. Okay, so the nice thing about this is that then we have um, an idea of the tints that are available. So I took just the two colors the pyrrole orange and the cobalt turquoise and just add a little bit of white to each one to kind of create a tinting scale also. But then look at the mixing complements, which is what we've been talking about this whole time. Adding, once again, just taking these two colors and working with each other, not adding any black, not adding any gray, just each other, that's the range of a small scale stepped range. And then I took those colors and tinted them. So I'm wow. working with three colors and not working hard. And that's the range I have to work with. So just to clarify, because I, you know, I like to make sure I can make sense. So basically you added a little bit of white to the orange, to the turquoise, found that's what you got. But then the bottom is you made the gray from mixing the two colors. You made the neutral and then added the neutral back into those tints. Yes. Wow. And I, well, I didn't add the neutral back into the tints. I added the neutral, I created the chromatic scale and then I tinted them. Gotcha. And so that, that way I had, you know, I got even more out of it, you know, Beautiful. so, you, can, you know, it just, it gives you more range. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's a lot more, sometimes it's a little more, sometimes you can play with, you know, the variations and, you know, how much white you put in, but it's amazing to me, and especially in this case, you know, you have two colors that are the Miami Dolphins, and yet you can create this painting because it's super easy to take complementary colors that are mixing complements and make that brown in the middle. Super easy to do. You just let one live, you know, live over the other, which is in this case is the orange. If the orange is stronger with a little bit of the turquoise in it, you've got the brown of the stems. So everything you need is there right? With just two colors and a little bit of tinting. Awesome. So that is the power of what we've been talking about today is taking those two colors and making them just explode for you. So, you know, as Donna and I have probably both said, you know, she who dies with the most paints wins. 
<laughs> but it is a lovely challenge sometimes to just take two colors and see how far you can stretch them because after something like this, um, uh, one of our other things we talked about was tetradic harmonies. So I'm gonna refer back to that for a moment with also some other samples for you to look at. Some just pictures I Googled. Where's the Google? Um, this. Okay, that's not it. <laughs> One minute. All right, remember this? Yep. If you weren't with us, we had the tetradic, you know, hip to be square discussion. This was literally using like cobalt turquoise and orange. With Making you know, everything else. And yellow and it all comes together. So that's where you find that, oh, I really like that combination of purple and yellow. Oh, I really like that combination of cobalt and, you know, turquoise and orange. And now let's put it all together in a painting. And so with four colors, <laughs> it just, it just explodes with what you can do with it and mix them in between. And as you can see with this, this is more of a watercolor. So you see like the pigment. I tend to use acrylics with water quite often just because I like how the pigments float because that's just an important part of it. And it's fun. I feel like I have more control over acrylic, but that's me. So that's Tetradic, back on that. And then back to this guy. So we have him. Now imagine paint pouring, you know, mm. or just letting them sit on the canvas and taking some distilled water and putting it over the top or a medium and airbrushing it around and see what they do together, you know, or a, a, a painting this, I, just grab these off Google. So I don't know the artist, it's not me, but oranges, it was what I was looking at when I was like, oh yeah, I wanna paint these. Look at that, turquoise a shadow. I'd probably go a little deeper with the turquoise to make those shadows in the orange, but it's a starting point. Um, and then I, carrots in a bowl. <laughs> it's amazing what you can find out there, but using once again, the shadow colors of the mix of the turquoise to create the form on that bowl and the shaping and all that stuff on the form on the carrots and you can even find buildings to do i would do the windows with a combination of those colors and to create the molding and it's all just by mixing those two colors and then mm. if you don't want to yes. mix them you just want to have fun <laughs> just go all pop art with it because <laughs> complementary colors are always good for for a bit of pop so that's it we have that and then your handout which i'll pull up on the screen just so you don't need to be staring at me and I'm sure that um, either has you asking follow-up questions or other things. So I guess this is a perfect time to open up the floor and let it fly. I'm going to pull up the digital mixer real quick because it, it appeared that some people had not seen it. So excuse me, I'm jumping into here again. All right. Um, to get to the mixer, obviously going to golden.com going up here to resources and virtual paint mixer. So digital mixer. And then what I'll do is if I have, I'm trying to move a window out of the way, sorry. If I have a color, you know, like the cobalt turquoise and I click on it and put it in the mixer and type in one. So I get some and ooh, I've got the cobalt turquoise with the tints to the side. That's what this means. Um, we do have a recording. We should probably send a link out to that at some point. Um, again, just the whole recording about the mixer. But then I was literally going into the mixer itself and they already have things like in subsets and in reds, they have all the oranges and all the reds and sort of all the pinky violets together. So it's really easy. They've already subset it for me and I can just go in here and I can even be even brattier and actually drop this down to um, single pigment colors. You have to start over, <laughs> but that makes me know that it's not something funky that's making it work. It's actually the kind of the theory that I understand. Um, and single pigment, just for people that are wondering, is basically that. But it just means you know sometimes blues can be red, and purples could be per pink or whatever it is. Like this is just means it's going to be turquoise. It doesn't have a a hint of anything else in it. And so when you're working with the mixer, when I put 
two, you know, slots of, of uh, orange in with a turquoise. Where I typically look to see if I feel like they're mixing complements, I'm always staring at this bottom highest tinted color because it shows me the bias so much easier than staring at this brown. <laughs> okay, when I'm looking here, I can see that that's kind of got an orange thing going on, you know, more orange than blue. So I drop this down and then I was looking at it and I'm like, it still kind of has like a, it's not quite gray. So that's when I jumped this one up. <clears throat> and then I'm like, okay, that looks more gray. And I'm always looking at this little circle down at the bottom. And then when I bump up turquoise some more, then this definitely starts looking blue. So that's where I'm like, okay, then I found my middle ground and I didn't have to squeeze out a bunch of paint to figure it out. It kind of gives Just me a Just out of curiosity, curiosity, what if you put cadmium orange in there? Hmm? What, what happens when it's not the pyrrole orange? That's the beautiful thing. That's that's why it's nice that you can literally go in and grab. And I would probably bump everyone down to one, but you know, gr click on that and then click over the one that you have, and it replaces the ingredient. And now you're getting a lot more greeny, gray, you know. But if I bump down the turquoise, you know, maybe, yeah, no, it's it's a brownie greeny, so it's a near complement. It's not a, a mixing complement. But the same, it's, it's true with all of them. You can just click on the color and click on the tube that you want to replace and see what that one did. That one's pretty close, you know, just about the same. Cadmium red light, see what that looks like. So this is where like, as Donna was saying, you can take the paint tubes you have and kind of experiment and see if you've got what you want. But this one, interesting, looks very uh, reddish, brownish. Let me add some more. Cobalt. I always love, cause you explain it as you can't unsqueeze paint but you can unsqueeze this. <laughs> yes, you can unsqueeze the tubes, you can add more and you can take away less. And it's just like, I, I like to say it's homework, it's palette homework. You're literally doing the homework and figuring out, okay, how do those work? Do the colors I have work? Maybe this one works better. Maybe I'll go buy that one or, you know, but it's so great to be able to do this with these literally using all of the digital spectrometry that they've done with these colors to make sure that this works. So it's very helpful. And then, you know, gives you a good idea. And I have discovered you know, in real use. It just helps me to understand. And that's why I tiptoed in with the orange because I knew, boy, that, you know, that has like double the strength. Let me just touch it because it doesn't seem like it's much different. You're saying, oh, three to one. It means you're gonna need just the tiniest bit of cadmium red light touching that turquoise or it's gonna go blah, really fast. So I usually go with things that the numbers are closer together or they're gonna be hard to mix. Okay, you with me on that? So a two to one is mm -hmm. way better to work with than a three to one because you're gonna be getting out a hair at a time <laughs> to add that orange in to really get a, a scale in between them. So uh, the closer the numbers are, the happier you'll be in actually using them. All right. Do we have any, any other questions, questions before uh, we close up for the day? I know that some people um, were new to the digital mixer, so that's exciting that, because um, I think it's technology. And sometimes if you're like, you don't know what you're looking at until somebody just goes through like you did so easily and uses it and tells you why you need it. I love it. I, these people are cracking me up. I was like, um, where's the rest of the day going to go? <laughs> Sheila has a question me. about the jelly plate. Sheila, yes. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Um, so I'd be new to this. I don't know if some other people were asking questions about what is the gel plate. And I wanted to know, besides I want to know the color of your lipstick, um, can you tape off the, if you get a larger plate than what you plan on so that you have some versatility with the size, like will the, will the plate take tape? I use painter's tape on mine all the time. So okay. the blue tape, you can set, I, in fact, what I would demonstrate for these, it shows, I would tell, uh, was, people were doing card making and I'm like, no reason why not to have the big honking plate so you can do whole sheets of paper. But if you just want to do a card front, literally tape off a five by seven, a four by six, a three, you know, a, a trading card size, Would tape off those areas and then keep one area open as a palette to roll colors and then move them into the area that you want. So absolutely blue painters tape won't hurt it at all. And why is this different 
or what's is there a different give than with glass or is there yes. what? there's a different give is, with this than with glass like glass i have glass plates but. oh it's, it, yeah there's a real big difference um uh, it's just about how it mixes on glass okay. you tend to see all the brush strokes right you know whereas with a gel plate it really it just okay. sort of everything is smooth i mean it's made it doesn't retain the brush strokes like that and mm -hmm. it also keeps the material fresher longer and generally it depends on what medium you're using but i've used oil paint you know rnf pigment sticks uh, acrylic paints alcohol inks i mean it's made if there's an oil material inside of it it's made with um mineral oil and so it's made literally to not repel but release everything that's on the plate so the difference with glass is literally if you're doing a glass monoprint you might get one print yeah. but you'll be hard pressed to get another one and especially those lines will move things won't stay in place it seems it holds the stencil and the materials down in place and it'll splay it's, too yeah yeah it just works and it works forever and you know that they are good i, I will I don't work for any particular company anymore, <laughs> but I will say that either company that make that starts with the letter G, their plates G for gel, go for those. Um, the ones that start with the letter S, both of those are bad. So no S, <laughs> just go for G for gel. And those companies yeah. work really well for everything that I've ever tried to use them for. Thank you. Thanks. Good question. <laughs> Was that politically correct enough? <laughs> I was so politically correct because I would have been like, "Don't buy the yes, they're <laughs> shitty." <laughs> you just have to post your lipstick color. Yeah, what's your lipstick color? <laughs> well, it's a combination of one that my daughter got me. Of course, it is called a flat out fabulous by Mac, <laughs> and a little bit of I think Plum Dandy also by Mac. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Why does it not shock me in the slightest that you blended two lipstick colors together to get the perfect one? <laughs> let me, let me, no, no, let me tell you. It's the painter side of me. I flat out <laughs> fabulous the whole thing. And then I only plum dandy, which is the shiny one on the centers of top and bottom. Great. Like you do as an artist, where are you going to add the highlights? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Oh my God, they like my lipstick. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, okay. this replay um, will be put on to Patreon and then any handouts that Sally Lynn uh, awesomely creates will also be available on my Patreon at any tier over there. I know a lot of you are already on Patreon and you already know this, but I just figured there are some newbies here. We, um, every time we do the color collabs, we... Play, put the replay on Patreon so all the patrons can catch it on their own timeline. All right, so you're gonna see fabulous. For now. Um, you have blew their mind with taping off the jelly plate. So yeah, t multiple mind blows today. Mm -hmm. Hey, all right. Well, well, uh, Donna will be posting it when it when the link everything is all up. I'm gonna go downstairs and make sure no one's done anything with the tile that I don't like. So. <laughs> All right. Bye, you guys. Thank you so much for joining in. And as always, Sally Lynn, thank you for making it so educational. <laughs> You're very welcome. Bye. Thank you.